Inspiration for Teachers podcast, bringing you dynamic and inspirational educator interviews. Our fascinating guests share their professional challenges and creative resolutions for success. Discover their workable strategies, ideas, and resources to reach your educational goals. And now your host, Kelly Long. Welcome to another episode of Inspiration for Teachers. I'm your host, Kelly Long, and I'm super thrilled that you've joined me on another episode today. Our inspirational educator on the show today is Julia Skinner, a retired head teacher in Bristol in the UK. She's also founder of something really amazing, which is the 100 Word Challenge, which she created in 2010 to encourage youngsters to write and link across the world with each other. Now that sounds totally amazing, Julia, and we're going to find out a little bit more about that from you in just a second. But what I would like you to do is just say hi to our listeners and just fill in the blanks from the introduction. Hello everyone. Yes, this is Julia speaking to you from Bristol. Uh, I retired from 13 years of primary headship in 2008. Didn't really know what to do with myself. Discovered Twitter. That led me into blogging. And as Kelly's mentioned, uh, I've got this amazing thing called the 100 Word Challenge, which really has provided me with a second career I didn't really know I needed. 100 Word Challenge is very simple, just as it says on the tin. I set the children a prompt, either of a few words or a picture, and they have 100 words to produce a creative piece of writing. And the emphasis is very much on creative rather than getting hung up on grammar and punctuation. Once they've written it, it is posted onto a blog, and then that is linked to 100wc.net, which is where the magic happens. I have a team of around 700 volunteers who visit every post, uh, hopefully, and they leave a a constructive comment, a very um, positive comment. And it's these comments that have really made a huge difference to writing progress and motivation in classes across the world. Uh, The children obviously can see a purpose in their writing because they have an extended audience. Uh, It's not just the class teacher that's standing in front of them. It could be somebody in Australia or somebody in Italy, somebody in the north of the country. Uh, And it has had uh, an amazing uh, impact on classrooms across the world, which is has been absolutely amazing for me because I didn't I didn't know it was going to be like that. Um, because it's only 100 words, it has really encouraged reluctant writers. Um, those who are high flyers have to actually hone their skills down from pages and pages just to those 100 words. It's huge now. Um, I only intended it to have have 30 entries. That would have done me. Uh, and I'm getting 1,500 entries a week now. Wow. <laughs> That's fabulous. That really is amazing. And It sounds silly thinking 100 words, but that is actually quite challenging. I mean, I do 140 characters on Twitter and it really pushes you to think quite clearly about what it is you want to communicate and 100 words that you must see some amazing stories coming through. Well, we do. And um, it's it, the children get really, when, when they first take it on, they count all the words. You know, they'll write two sentences and you can see them sitting, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> um, they soon get, get over that um, and they then see, they, they get the, the idea of what, you know, they can visualise what a hundred word looks like. And for those teachers that have taken it on, and I have teachers who have been doing it for about three years now, they've said it's an opportunity to get rid of all those silly little words, you know, the ands and the buts and the sos. And I mean, it sounds like I'm getting rid of all the connectives, but I'm not. It's about making children think, right, um, or students, because because obviously it's a, a challenge for under 16s and actually looking at a word and deciding whether it's valuable enough to go into their piece of writing um, and although it's only a hundred words um, it is an encourage I do encourage youngsters to actually plan it because they seem to think, you know, if they're going to plan a long, uh, if they're going to do a long piece of writing, they they automatically will have a plan. But those that do it regularly have realised that actually I do need to to plan what I want to say because I haven't got 
that freedom of lots and lots of words. And some of them, you know, they they get really involved and they'll write me little messages on the bottom. I'm really sorry I ran out of words. Wow. <laughs> that is super exciting, Julia. And the thing is, the reason you have a new career is because you're a former head teacher and you don't know how to give it all up. <laughs> But what we're going to do is we're going to just shift the pace slightly and we're going to dive into a question that we like to ask about teaching and learning before we move on to your educational challenge of overcoming reluctance to learning. A question that I've been asking of my most recent guests is is to do with teaching and learning just so that we can really get to the heart of what's important and how we can help other teachers in the classroom or other schools kind of implement good ideas. In your opinion, what do you think is the most important tool a teacher has in their toolkit to aid learning? I think it's incredibly difficult because the toolbox is um, absolutely huge. Um, But I think something that every teacher needs to approach every student with is the you can do it approach. Um, Whatever level the, the young learner is at, the, the teacher, the facilitator, the support, whatever role the, the adult is playing, they have to approach it with a, you can do this. Um, and that obviously means that the teacher needs to have that belief themselves. So I think it's about optimism, it's about confidence, um, it's about a love of learning. And I think if you've got those, then you will impart those to your students and they, they will then be able to see, yeah, yes, I can do it. And I think a good response back to I can't do it. And I think the word you need to say is yet. You can't do it yet, but you will. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. It's, it's all about confidence, I think. We're going to put you now in the centre of our educational compass and find out from you in 60 seconds or less, if you can do it, what excites you about the teaching profession and also what you would most like to change and why? Um, I I think there is a lot of energy around at the moment. Um, Some of it feels a bit negative at times, but I think there there is a lot of energy and there's a lot of sharing, particularly with the the use of social media. Um, things that I'd like to change, if I had a magic wand, I, I think I would prefer that the profession and the government and all that um, actually got on a bit better. Um, I think so much energy is wasted trying to score points either side. Um, and, you know, we haven't got time to waste. Moving forward, Julia, we're going to discuss some thought provoking ideas and we're going to look at that issue regarding reluctance towards learning. But just before we go there, I just want to explain to all of our listeners that they can go to our podcast resource page and they can find all of the show notes there. So everything that Julia discussed in the show today and all of her resources. Also, we'll be tweeting out about the show and sharing some of the key points that we think are the most valuable to help you in your educational sphere. So you can follow that at Inspiration40. So let's go to that educational challenge, Julia, and I'd quite like you to set the story in the scene as to what that challenge was regarding reluctance to learning, what kind of issues you came across, and also give us some ideas and some tools and some solutions so that others can implement them in their educational sphere. I was a SENCO um, very quickly in my teaching career, and so I learnt... um, I I was able to see reluctance in all its forms. Um, So I've always felt that I I had a a bag of bribery and corruption that I carried with me, (laughs) whether it was for big people or little people. And um, I always felt that my role was to try and offer some sort of... um, tool to go along the path of solution I wouldn't offer the solution because a most of the time I wouldn't have the solution but also it wouldn't be down to me but it was about yes there's this brick wall how we've got to get over it are we going to take out a brick are we going to climb over it are we going to dig a hole under are we going to go around the side so it was all about trying to provide different opportunities Um, and reluctance is is quite interesting because as as I've um, gone through my career there there is reluctance right the way through you know children being reluctant to actually have a go make a start um, teachers towards new initiatives 
um, governors towards decisions that, that need to be taken, um, heads being really worried to to be risk takers because of the you know the impending doom that you know Ofsted can bring and and for myself you know I'm trying to get myself down to getting down to work so I think it's always been for me about um, bite sized pieces looking at what the problem is and then trying to put it into an objective format that you can divide up into small steps and doing those small steps celebrating each of those small steps each time to try and um, build the confidence it links back to my teaching and learning it, it's about building confidence those steps that you've just suggested does that apply to all of those different scenarios so is it the same kind of approach to dealing with a child in a classroom that's saying no I don't want to do this as it is dealing with teachers that don't want to take on new initiatives is it, is it the same process that you found works for all of those scenarios you know as a head teacher my class was the staff and as a class teacher my class were the children so it's you know and as um as a as a governor you know your class is is actually looking at the the strategic staff the slt so it, it can be applied right the way through but i i always felt that it was really important to um to to help offer some solutions offer those ideas that people that would actually get people out of the stuck stuck position that they were in and taking those first steps in Jason Borton's episode number three, he was talking about something similar in, in one of the things that he was mentioning. And he was saying that sometimes when you're looking at your school or your learners, it's trying to decipher where on a scale they are with their buy-in. So are they at the point where it's, yes, I'm very much into this and I'm on board and I support it, or yeah, I like the idea, but there's a slight bit of reluctance. Can you give me a bit more information? Or at the other end of the scale, it's no, I really disagree with this. I don't want to do it. And he was saying that it's a very complex, but quite tricky to try and shift that person that doesn't want to do it. But he said that there are ways of looking at how you can approach the person that doesn't want to do it and he was saying might be they need extra training they the message hasn't been communicated to them effectively so he was saying some really interesting things about that my approach was always to find a positive wizard and even now in in governors meetings and you know i i do quite a lot of governance work i talk about positive wizards you have to find those people that have already bought in you need those on your side so that you're not a, a lone voice. And then you will have that you then build the team uh, gradually getting down to probably somebody who you will never move. But at the beginning of a new initiative, at the beginning of a piece of learning, your energy needs to be spent with the positive wizards and those three or four people behind them, not on the person that can't be moved at the be you know at the beginning because that's wasted energy because what i found is your positive wizards will take it on they will then shine with it whether it's um a new initiative you know um we're, we're taking on a new way of teaching reading they are doing it the, People can see the enthusiasm, they can see, because positive wizards will always make something work and they will always be there to um, sell the whatever it is. And people will see that and people will want to, to have a bit of that. And gradually the number of people that want to buy in increases so that the, the people at the end of the tail, those reluctant ones, really get up, get fewer and fewer and depending on what it is if it's somebody who really cannot move and it is really impacting on what is happening in their classroom then obviously that's the time for some really difficult conversations but before that they have to see that it isn't you know as as head i would say right this is you know this is an initiative hopefully you know slt had discussed it and all that sort of thing give it to your positive teachers they will run with it gradually all the staff take on board and for those who who are reluctant 
you need to talk to them find out what it is why you know what is it you know why why aren't you keen on this try and support them in whatever way you can um but at the bottom you know the, the bottom line is if it's something that clearly is working for the rest of the school and for the youngsters in the classroom if they're not able to engage in that and they've been given lots of support then it's you know difficult conversation time yeah i think you're right i think also you know those people can irradiate such negativity that to just be around them is exhausting so i think that's a really good strategy you know making your positive wizards go with it first and then hopefully that the energy will flow around that and bring everybody on board but yeah julia you've probably had some very difficult conversations in the past <laughs> <laughs> well i was known to have a cunning plan i even now people you know know that i have I usually have a, a cunning plan and I just hoped that they were there weren't too many of them that were baldrick cunning plans. <laughs> yeah. They didn't blow up too much in your face. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's fabulous, Julia. What we're going to do, we're going to switch now into a bit more of a faster pace of the show and we're going to go into our inspiration round. And it's your opportunity to explore your best education resources so that you can add some value to other educators in our field. So what I like to do at the start is I like to shine the light on you and I'd like to go to your proudest moment and why that was. Getting my deputy headship. Um, I'd been away from teaching for two years. I'd had a break uh, and I'd returned via a part time post and then I'd gone into a full time post. And um, I felt that actually applying for the job, it was a bit soon, but it sounded really interesting. And even though I'd only been back teaching for five years, um, I thought I'd give it a go. And um, I, I got the, the deputy headship. And within a term, I was acting head because the, the head teacher didn't come back from his summer holidays. And um, that was my, my proudest moment when the authority said in the summer, in the September, that I could they would trust me to to be acting head and I was able to bring my organisational skills into the situation that we found ourselves in, which which did need organising. And then once the framework was in place, um, we as a whole staff, we were able to move the school forward. It was really interesting what you just said there about trusting you to take on the headship was was there an element of doubt on their part? And, and if there was, what do you think brought about your ability to secure that position moving from acting head to head? Well, I don't think it, I think the doubt was with me. I thought that only having been a deputy for a, a seasonal term, I was appointed in the April and this was, you know, this all happened. The head didn't come back in the September. I thought there was no way that they would trust this fairly large junior school um, to somebody so inexperienced. But I asked if I could have a go and they said yes. They, they didn't question it. Um, they made sure that I had support available should I need it, which I was very um, appreciative of, the fact that it was there if I needed it, not it was there all the time. Um, so I was able to, to have a go. So I think that the doubt was on my side um, rather than on the authorities' side. And, um, you know, it, it worked really well. The staff were very, very supportive. They hadn't got on well with the previous head and were looking for a change. So I was really lucky. You know, I did pick up a, a whole gang of positive wizards there. Um, and, it, and it was very exciting. Very exciting. Nice move there. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to move on now to the best advice you have ever received to do some writing that was that was said to me by alexander mccall smith who um people may or may not know he is the author of the first lady detective agency series and scotland street and he's written oh hundreds and hundreds of books um i've always been a fan of his and i was really he loved he lives in edinburgh when he's not traveling the world and i was very lucky to meet him and actually have coffee with him i was invited to his house 
And this was in the early days of retiring when I just discovered blogging. Um, and I was playing with the idea of, you know, should I write? Should I look at this? And um, this was way before 100 Word. Um, and um, I, I chatted to him about some of my ideas, uh, particularly a, an occasional series called Tales from the Head's Office, which he was quite interested in. And his advice was just to do some writing. And by doing that, uh, that actually led me into developing the 100 Word Challenge because I suddenly discovered that although I, I was okay at English, but it wasn't a particular passion, you know, I wasn't a, somebody who kept a diary or anything, but I really enjoyed it. Um, didn't write a lot, even now on my blogs, I don't write very, very much. I write more than 100 words, but not much more than 500, certainly. And so that, was, uh, that actually led me to, to developing the 100 Word Challenge. So um, in my sort of retired years, that's the best piece of advice I've, I've received. That is great advice. Wonderful. So what are your sources of inspiration? My husband, he has always been there, bless him. He's, uh, he, when I was a head teacher, he retired uh, before me and he came and supported me in school. He used to run three reading books, three reading groups. Um, he sorted out all the football, organised football tournaments and made bookcases. Um, and he has never doubted my ability to do anything I want to do, which I think is absolutely amazing. I doubt myself all the time. Um, but it has been, he is my inspiration um, being here with me. My other inspiration is my son who has just become a head teacher. Um, and I am incredibly proud of him, incredibly proud of him. Uh, we were together on our own uh, when he was little. Um, I was a single mum for, you know, quite a few years. Uh, and he has done immensely, immensely well. And I am so proud of him. And he is an inspiration to me because I see him as a he's not quite 40 yet. He's there as a head teacher in the profession that I love. And um, it's great. So the two men in my life are my inspiration. Well, it sounds as though they make your heart glow, Julia. So it's, it's making me feel a bit teary. <laughs> <laughs> so can you share with us a personal teaching or education habit that works for you time and again? Starting where whoever you're working with is. Um, so whether you're a, whether it's a big person or a small person, it's very much like you were saying um, about a previous um, interviewee. Um, you need to start from where they are, particularly in this um, this climate where we have to get them to point Z. Um, and they really should be at point W, but they are actually only at point M. And you need to start from where they are rather than where they should be. Because otherwise, if you, if you try and start from where they should be, you've got this huge battle all the time. So it is about establishing where that point is, accepting that perhaps your job's going to be even harder than you imagined, but you know where you're starting from. So it's about establishing that base point to then move forward. And I think that works for, you know, littles and grown-ups. And I think that works well if it's communicated effectively to the actual, well, to the actual students, because they need to know where they have to be, but also they've got to figure out for themselves sometimes how they're going to get there. They just can't wait on us to, you know, well, this is what we're doing and this is how we're going to get there and, and, and it all being on is some of the, the responsibility needs to be back on them. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, my, my headship was in South Bristol, which is an area of, you know, quite severe deprivation. And the, the idea of actually doing anything in, in any sort of format of school was, well, don't be silly. I live in, you know, I live in the south of Bristol. Um, and it's about giving them that confidence, but also building in resilience, giving them the resilience to actually keep going, even when it's pants and even when it doesn't work. You keep going because you will get there in the end. Um, so it's, it's, it's all about the same sort of package. You know, it's about giving them confidence by support and then gradually removing that support so that they can be independent learners and can build that resilience so that failure is actually seen as something 
good that you can build on. And that's really hard. That's hard as a grown up to, to be able to take on. But I think if we can give that to our youngsters, then we will really be helping them as they move forward in the in the society, in the world that we're we're facing now. It's fabulous. I couldn't agree with you more on that one. That's really good. Thank you, Julia. Now we're going to move on to a resource that you can share with our listeners that you think might add value to their daily practice. Well, obviously, I, I, I have to say 100 word challenge, but, you know, that's not going to make a lot of use to not going to be a lot of use to mathematicians in the secondary school, possibly. Um, since retiring, I have I have discovered Twitter. I have discovered um social media and I am just so excited by it and if I was ahead now I would encourage strongly you can imagine the look I'm giving I I can I can feel it coming through the computer (laughs) to to join Twitter um for for their professional development because there is this wonderful engagement it's the dialogues that you can have um and to use social media in the most positive ways i would also make sure that we we held regular teach meets which i think are just a wonderful invention i have been to many and i've never come away without feeling oh i wish i had a group of children to try that on and I wasn't I wasn't a teaching head at all so you know for me to come away feeling that energized um so I I would say apart from 100 word challenge um get yourselves on twitter get yourselves talking engage in the dialogue um join in the conversations because it will not only give you ideas for your daily practice but it will tell you more about the profession you know the profession isn't just the times educational supplement you know it it's all of us together um so that that would be um my resource and the teach meets are fantastic i mean you go there you know in an hour they split it down into 10 minute slot presentations and and people are just giving you great ideas about not just classroom practice but what you can do on a wider school scale and it's just you walk away literally thinking give me a group of kids (laughs) I'm going to do all this on them now and we'll see what happens. The best thing about Teach Meets is it's from practitioners that have tried it so I think there's nothing better than for somebody to stand up and say right well we bought this package it's really good but I changed this this and this so that the people in the audience can then think, yes, I'd quite like that, but not have to go through all the things that didn't work for them. So I think that it's the fact that it's practitioners who have used whatever it is, sharing with that enthusiasm. It's a group of positive wizards. Now we're coming towards the end of the show. And just before we go, I'd like to say a huge thank you from me for joining me on the show, what you've shared with us today. I'm sure our listeners are going to learn so much from you. But before we say goodbye, how can our listeners connect with you? Right. Well, if they're on Twitter, I have to give you that first. I'm at the head's office um, or they can email me um, at jskinner675 at gmail.com or just fill out the form on 100 Word, which is 100wc.net. Thank you for joining us today on Inspiration for Teachers. For more resources, tips and advice, visit our website, inspirationforteachers.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, we would love to connect with you. Just click like on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash inspirationforteachers. 